you better be banking the mortgage at that point, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> at what point do you look up and say, I think I need to do this full time? We were at like 10 or 12 properties, I think. Gotcha. And it was, I mean, I, I'm good at multitasking. Like I have kids too, mm -hmm. but I had like one computer screen open and then one computer screen open here. And so over here, I'm like, you know, on my calls <laughs> with Microsoft, yeah. like, oh yeah, like let's, you know, we'll talk about that. And then on this one, I'm like responding to guests, like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, great. I've right. had those conversations for <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know, and the first year, it was a little scary because we did it right at the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, 2020, the beginning was really un uncertain for a lot of people. Um, we didn't have any bookings. Sometimes you do need to reset the expectation. The goal is that we've got a pretty healthy exit at yeah. the end of the decade. And you know, you're just a better investor than me, man. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Yeah, super excited to have you on, brother. We still have to come up with a name for this segment. Don't have a name yet. It's just on the Real Estate Robinson's YouTube channel. But the goal here is to highlight stories of people who are in the Airbnb space, who are, you know, been in it for a while, have had some success, to hopefully inspire the folks that are watching this video to follow your footsteps, man. So very cool. Um, I think first, let, let's let's just give me a quick overview of what your business looks like today. Okay, so today we are in four markets, all in Arizona. We are in Bullhead City, Lake Havasu, Fort Mojave Valley. We are sitting at a, usually between fifty and sixty Airbnb properties. Mm -hmm. Last year, we started the cleaning company that cleans the properties in Lake Havasu. So we're kind of doing both, which works really well when you have like an integrated mm -hmm. cleaning company in yeah. your management portfolio. So yeah, we're got the cleaning company. I have, you know, you're going to give me crap, but one VA working <laughs> yeah. for me remotely. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's so 50 to 60 properties and your, your strategy, like, I guess, give me the breakdown of that 50 to 60. What percentage are yours versus ones that you manage for other owners? So I have two, there are two properties and then we, man we manage the rest. Some are they range from like $99 a night to a thousand plus dollars a night. Some mm -hmm. are waterfront homes with beaches and private boat launches and RV hookups. And then, you know, some of them are like my first property where it's mm -hmm. just a three bedroom, two bath manufactured home, mm -hmm. but in a great location and decorated really nice. And it does well. Yeah. So I, I definitely want to get into how you built up this portfolio because you did it relatively quickly, right? To, to get to 50 to 60 properties, um, it's a really impressive feat. But just high level, what's your typical management uh, fee that you charge to, to your owners? So it's 20% of the nightly rate. We did some research. You know, the average rate, I think, for short-term management is between 15. I know there's the nationwide chains that'll do 10%. But for hands-on full service, it's usually between 15 I've even seen as high, I don't know if you have, like 45, 50% yeah, in some markets. The first Airbnb we bought was the previous owner had it with the property management company, and they offered to, you know, extend their services right. to us. 40% was what nope. they wanted to charge us. I mean, you better be banking the mortgage at that yeah, point. Yeah, right? <laughs> and, and the crazy part, and like this is an important part for folks that are watching. Just because someone says they're a property manager doesn't necessarily mean that they're good. Because that same property manager that wanted to charge us 40% of gross... Yeah. That property with them the previous year did like ninety six thousand dollars in revenue. We did a, I think one hundred and thirty five that first year, and then the last two years were about a one twenty somewhere in that ballpark. So imagine, you know, thirty forty thousand dollars less in revenue plus an additional forty percent going off to the management fee. So that's why it's important to really make sure that before you do hire a property manager, you want to vet them to make sure that they know what's going on because just because they're doing it yeah. and they're good at it. Well, and just making sure they're hyper local too. Like it's not, you know, there there's some. Lo even local property management companies that are, I would say, competitors coming into the game, but mm -hmm. they're very much like if you look at their properties listed, their pricing, it's just stagnant the same rate throughout the week. Yeah. They're very much a set it, forget it mm -hmm. kind of experience. And for us, like our rates, 20 percent, we said that to be competitive. But we also like I can show them data to show that like our properties do. 20 to 40% higher occupancy mm -hmm. than similar properties. So we essentially pay for ourselves right. and we do full service stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we've, I mean, we've kicked parties out. We change air filters in your properties. Like, you know, a lot of more of the hands-on stuff. So I, I want to talk about the scale piece because, you know, you're at 50, 60 properties. How long ago did you start? Like, when did you get your first unit? So friends of mine will say that I manifested it. I think I forced Gump my way into it. So <laughs> it was just, you know, I, I was at my parents' house. They have a vacation home in Bullhead City. That's where they're going to retire. And it was 4th of July weekend. My daughter was like two, three years old. And I didn't want to be those parents that are shushing everybody, you know, when the baby goes down for <laughs> yeah, a nap. Same. We're the same way. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, let's maybe, maybe we get a vacation home. I was working for Microsoft at the time. We found a cute house probably a couple miles away. And we were like, you know, I can probably Airbnb this when it's not, when we're not here. And hopefully it just covers itself, you know, and 
the first year, it was a little scary because we did it right at the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, 2020, the beginning was really un uncertain for a lot of people. Um, we didn't have any bookings. You know, we were coming into the game and I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to lose this house. Yeah. And, you know, Californians can't sit still, mm -hmm. of course. And Arizona's just a drive away. So, you know, it just it picked up like no one's business. I had people leaving at 11 a.m. and new ones coming in at 3 o'clock. We hired a cleaner at the time who I had my ring cameras on. And I would see her like walking up the driveway at like 1.30 mm -hmm. and then leaving at like 2.30. Yeah. And she's like, house is clean. It looks great. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> there's no way you yeah. did like the laundry like, and everything. Bedroom, everything. No, yeah. no way. And guys, let me just like, just to give some context there, like when you're interviewing cleaners for your Airbnb business, definitely one of the questions you want to ask is, hey, how long do you think it'll take to clean my five bedroom, five bathroom, 3,000 square foot, three story cabin? And if they're like, I could probably get in and out in 45 minutes. That is not the person you want to hire, right? Like, you know, there should there should be some some thought and that, that goes into it. And that's why I think like interviewing multiple cleaners up front is good, especially if you're new, because if you ask that question to three different cleaners and one says, I need about two hours. The second one says, I need about two hours. And that last person says, I need about 45 minutes. Now you know who who's not really gonna do the job the right way. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's you, okay. It's and cheapest point. is not always the best. Yeah. Um you know, definitely do research on, you know, what, what, you know, fair for cleaning fees and all that kind of stuff is, but that's one of the big things. Cleaning fees don't scrimp on, you know, especially if you have a pool, mm -hmm. your pool guy is, you know, so important. Don't scrimp on that. But yeah, so that was our first property that we bought. And that was 2019, you said? So end of 2019 going gotcha. into 2020. So, and then just for context, we're recording this video, like end of 2023, so about four years, yeah. you're able to scale up to 50, 60 properties in your co-hosting business. So that's incredibly impressive. Walk me through how you made the transition or why you made the transition from the first two that you owned into co-hosting and how you found that first client. So I got really tight with our cleaner. She, she and I, when, we, when, we, when I bought my first house, she was cleaning my, my uncle's house out there like twice away. Her name's Sarah. She's awesome. Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she, I, I was one of her first like Airbnb properties. And when we walked it, I was like, hey, like there's hospitality. There's some finer touches. I want towels rolled a certain way. You know, I want the toilet paper mm -hmm. when you go to a hotel where it's, you know, whatever. Little folds in yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was one of her first, and she cleans like upwards of like 100 right now out there. But throughout the time that she was cleaning my properties, I had bought in a second one because she made life easy for mm -hmm. me. I didn't have to watch my ring cameras. So we bought our second one. And the whole time she was kind of in my ear like, you know, your properties do very well. They're never left trashed. You seem to really enjoy this whole thing we should start a business. I have all these Airbnb customers that I'm cleaning their houses for mm -hmm. and they're firefighters, nurses, you know, doctors, they can't just be on their phone all the time. Like they're, they're a little bit frustrated. I think we can start a business. You enjoy this. I enjoy this side of it. And at the time I was working for Microsoft, like made six figures a year. I was like, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But then Microsoft had, you know, COVID pushed us all at home and I could see the writing on the wall, probably how you did with right. where you were working, where this isn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I finally got with her. I was like, let's do this. So I remember we pitched our first customer that she cleaned their house with like what we were going to do, what our services were like. And he was like, I'm, a, I'm a, let's do it. I'm down. Like, this is awesome. I, you know, I'm excited. And then Sarah and I were super excited too. Okay. Like, okay, we got our first. Yeah. And then it just kind of grew from there. Like it became a combination of her existing cleaning owners that business, she was cleaning. Right? Yeah. W were, were some of them. And then I started to really go hard on social media. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of ours from social media, you know, Instagram Interesting. and things like that. I, I, want, I want to pause on that for a second. Before we touch on the social, I just want to, I want to go back to that, that first interaction because I think for a lot of people that are watching, they can get the idea or, or like the premise of co-hosting, right? Where, and I guess I should probably define that for those that are watching, right? Co-hosting means that um, you're basically acting as a property manager for someone else's short-term rental. So just like a long-term rental property management company, same thing, but in the short-term rental space, for whatever reason, we call it co-hosting, okay? So uh, I think a lot of people understand the concept and it's an attractive way to get started because it costs you no money to take over someone's listing, no, right? Definitely. Like you don't have to put down a down payment, the owners are the ones that are fronting the cost for the, yep. the furnishings, the setup costs. If something breaks, they're the ones that are paying for it. Yep. Like you, it, it's a very high margin business. Mm -hmm. Definitely more work, uh, but definitely high margin. So I think people that are watching like the idea, like the, the concept, but that first question of like, man, how do I find that client? How do I get that first client? So for you, you took a relationship you had with your cleaner and used that relationship to get that first deal. 
But were they already with an existing property management company or were they self-managing? They were self-managing. Gotcha. So I would say many, if, I mean, we've taken some from Evolve, sorry. Yeah. We've taken some from them, but most of them, it was self-managing where just, it was just overwhelming for them with like the 24 hour messaging, the smart locks, the, I mean, a lot of them, there were kind of, I mean, if I were starting brand new and I didn't have the connection with the cleaner, I would also be looking at some of the listings that are maybe in my same market that are stagnant mm. and trying to approach those owners with how you could bring value to their property, whether it's more booking, because at the end of the day, that's their whole goal. They want to make money is how you can bring more value to what they're doing. So then, yeah, that, they were all self-managed before. And what, what did that pitch look like? Like, what did you actually <laughs> say to that first person? It was awkward as hell. Yeah. Um, we, Sarah, so Sarah and I, we had, we'd gone back and forth for a couple months as far as like what our services are going to look like. We, we did research evolve and, and, you know, the big ones and say like, okay, what are they doing? And then what, what could we actually do? Uh, um, you know, we, one of the things is like a big one in our market from complaints from long-term people that live there year round is trash. So like trash piles up at some of these houses. And then with the Arizona winds, like it just scatters everywhere you know, in addition to things like noise. So like the weekly trash is one of the things that like we could practically get done, putting out, taking back air filters in the property. So like Arizona, they're using their air conditioning nearly year round. Mm -hmm. So air filters is a big one because nobody wants their air conditioning to be, to go out, go out in the <laughs> yeah. summertime, which has happened to us. So changing those air filters out once a month, they don't cost a lot of money either. Propane tanks. So we do, we were like, okay, if they have a barbecue, we can do the propane tank refill once a month. Mm -hmm. Um, at our cost. So we were a lot more hands on with it. And then just as we grew, you know, and looking at some of this data from Airbnb, we could show that like our properties are not only standing out, they're doing more in occupancy than similar properties on there. And so we decided, I think it was at like property number 15 or something like that, that we decided our startup cost, if you wanted to get on board with us, was going to be a thousand dollars. Yeah. So which is very reasonable. Super I think reasonable. so. Like, uh, there, there are some people that, you know, blink on it, but I have to explain to them, like we're, you know, you're coming out of the gate as a super host in a brand new listing. So like you're getting prioritization there. We're doing your, your, their copy, your branding, your marketing, we we build a house manual for all of our properties mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So like that takes time. Right. Um, that also includes property photos. So we mm -hmm. do interior, exterior and drone. Um, it's a lot that goes into it, but I mean, that's all you have to do. Yeah. You literally just yeah, so, yeah. You just show up, right? Yeah. So, but it sounds like you know. If I can repeat repeat back what you said, uh, Ryan, you said that you really understood what the pain points were for owners in that market, yeah. and then when you approach those people, you approach them with those pain points. Not only the pain points of the owners, the pain points of the city and the residents that live there too. Because mm -hmm. I know that like it was probably me. What twenty twenty one, twenty twenty two? That Airbnb really started to get sticky nationwide with different markets and. You know, you'd hear articles come out of horror stories and things. And so I wanted to also be that, fill that gap between the community that I don't want them to re regulate them really hard, but I also want to make sure that like, you know, the, the properties are taken care of and we can you know, make profitable business out of them too. So I wanted to sort of bridge that gap. And it was understanding what the pain points were of the people that are self-managing and then the pain points of like the city. Um, and so another thing that we do too, is we also like have partnerships with a lot of the local businesses out there, the boat rental companies, um, you know, that offer us exclusive discounts too. So there's, there's, there's a value brought for the people coming to stay at our properties. Um, there was a call I took maybe two months ago, random call. And she's like, Hey, this is so-and-so from, you know, power boat, power sports boating. I just wanted to call and thank you for all the people you've thrown our way. And I was like, Powers, what? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, you've given us a lot of customers mm -hmm. that rent boats out here. And I'm like, really? And then I was thinking about it. We have her. And it was literally just, I took the top person in Yelp. I did look at like reviews and like the services that the, and the fleet of boats that they have. But I literally took her contact information. And in our first morning message that we sent out to all of our guests that stay in Lake Havasu, I said, hey, if you're looking for a boat rental, reach out to these people mm -hmm. because they have a great fleet and, you know, whatever. And she's been getting customers from it. And it was just kind of cool that, like, they reached out to us and were like, thanks for giving us Super this cool. business that, you know, we never would have had. Yeah. And not to go too far off on that tangent, but uh, we just had a um, host who does our digital guidebooks in one of our group coaching calls for our coaching program. Mm -hmm. And they actually told me that there's a – you can integrate – a payment processor like Stripe into your digital guidebook, I've seen that, yeah. and then you can offer things like that. So someone could actually book directly through their digital guidebook one of these power boats, and then you would just that. coordinate on the back end with the boat company. So we, 
we, we, I think we, we have a good idea of who comes and stays at our properties and we, we do both. So we have like a digital version of a house manual that goes out to them before they check in. And then there's a physical one there. We tossed around the idea because of just staying limber with if a Wi-Fi password changes or if something changes, we can make a digital change. Yeah. But our guests sometimes are a little bit older and want the, physical, want the physical book. And it's something that like I can tell that they read mm -hmm. when they check in. And, you know, and to me, it also adds just a level of polish yeah. to it, too. I think that for some of our properties, it would be good. Some of more like the younger hip crowd that mm -hmm. brings. But some of them, I don't know that uh, it would be it, it would be it wouldn't. Yeah, it doesn't fly with every market. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Then I'm getting the messages of like, what's your Wi-Fi <laughs> password? I'm like, didn't you read the digital guidebook? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let, so you 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 go through that first client and you pitch them on like, hey, here are your pain points. Here are the things that we can solve for yeah. you. You get that first one in. How do, how do you scale? Right. Like, what does that process look like? Are you still just doing manual outreach to your cleaners? Current client base. Talk to me a little bit about the social media work you were doing. What is what is the scale look like? So the social media, I focused on. We we hired the best photographer. We didn't we didn't try to, you know, talk them down on their pricing. Like, hey, if we give you ten customers, like, I want this pricing. It's to me, photography is an art, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to negotiate Discount someone's, someone's art. art. Yeah. yeah, and I think because of that, like our our photographer, like he definitely refers us to people too because of mm -hmm. that. But because we use such great quality work, it also shows through on our brand like it is our brand like our instagram has his photos but our branded logo you know a lot of our content on there um the second property that we got um her name's christina she's awesome but she um found us from a realtor mm. so a realtor out in the area and did you know that realtor like i did, did yeah, yeah, yeah okay yeah so i started building connections with and i think sarah did as well she started building connections. I mean, she, Sarah knows everybody in Bullhead too, but she started building, we, we connected with realtors. We needed pool people for some of these properties. And then as we're doing like maintenance stuff, you know, we're connecting and finding handyman. And so like at one point it became, anytime the conversation of Airbnbs came up in these cities, they thought of us and they knew us. Super cool. Um, and then it just, people started finding Coming us. In. Yeah, like yeah. we, I mean, it's all been social media and, and word of mouth. Like I don't do search engine optimization. I mean, you could probably find us on Google if you searched us, but it's literally all been word of mouth, organic growth, which is really cool. Yeah. So at what point, because you're working at Microsoft, you know, healthy six figure salary. Yeah. At what point do you look up and say, I think I need to do this full time? We were at like 10 or 12 properties, I think. Gotcha. And it was, I mean, I, I'm good at multitasking. Like I have kids too, mm -hmm. but I had like one computer screen open and then one computer screen open here. And so over here, I'm like, you know, on my calls with Microsoft, yeah. like, oh yeah, like let's, you know, we'll talk about that. And then on this one, I'm like responding to guests like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. great. Um, and I could do it. Yeah. It's just, it became a balance of like, when I had breaks from Microsoft, I wasn't going and hanging with my kids or mm -hmm. having lunch with my family because I was working remotely and from home, I was doing more right. this stuff. And so... I also saw the writing on the wall with the organization that I was in within Microsoft that it wasn't sustainable and it wasn't going to be around six months, nine mm -hmm. months from here, from a year from there. And I was just, I approached my wife and I was like, I think, I think I can do this. And I think if I devoted 40 hours a week from this to doing this, like, I think I can grow this. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was the beginning of 2023. I went to our team. I think we were at like 20, maybe 15 or something at that time. And listings. I, yeah, listings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I said to them, I was like, I want to be at 50 properties by summer and I want to be at 100 by the end of the year. We're not going to hit We're not going to hit 100, but they looked at me like I was crazy mm -hmm. for saying 50 by summer. Um, I think they were kind of scared too because summer is like our busy months mm -hmm. as well. So like they were thinking like we're going to be losing our minds during the summertime, but we we hit 50 and It's amazing. Um, it kind of all came at once too right before summer and manifesting, I guess. Yeah. So a, a couple of things I want to circle back on here, because when you think about scaling that quickly, you know, you scale fast, things break. Yeah. You know, we, we bought like my first year going in this full time. I think we went from three Airbnbs. We finished out year with like 15 or something, right? So we we're buying like a, a property a month pretty much and setting it up and things broke, right? Because we we're moving so fast. So for you, as you scaled, what things were you kind of seeing break as you went from, you know, 10 to 50? The house manuals, I would say, was the big one because, mm -hmm. you know, someone gets started with us and we get the listing live, the pricing's connected with Price Labs and bookings are coming in and then that's great. And then, you know, they got a guest that's checking in today and we're like, oh shit, we haven't done the house manual yet. The guests yeah. don't have the house manual. Yeah. What are we going to do? And so like, I'm busting out the house manual real quick. I'm sending them a digital link. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things. And then I don't think, 
I think with Hospitable, which is what we use for our PMS software, that helped us a lot with like the auto messages. Mm -hmm. So once we got like the check-in instructions, the first morning, the checkouts, it was kind of smooth sailing. Mm. And then I hired my first VA, her name is Ash, and she's awesome. That was probably one of the pain points, not a, I wouldn't call it a pain point, but just somebody who doesn't live in the United States teaching them about like, a property here, a that's property, a continent away. The, yeah, well, and just, I, I remember our first call with her, she, I mean, I probably hired her after a 10 minute interview, but I, I remember our first call where I was like training her, I was like, okay, this is the United States. So San Francisco's like over here, Bullhead City's like right <laughs> yeah. here. You go down like an hour, this is like Havasu. Mm -hmm. And so right. I was kind of just showing her like the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we sort of we sort of went through each property on our listing. And she's been great at helping me build out like the systems behind the scenes too, as mm -hmm. far as like, like our team, when they need to buy air filters, like I don't have to reach out to the owner and say, hey, what's the air filter size of your house? Do you know? Like, it's all kind of like, we're getting more organized. Yeah. I would say software helped us hugely because I think the first 10 properties, I was not leaning on Airbnb smart pricing. I was doing that myself. Hmm. So like every morning, you know, on the toilet, yeah. I'm going through, I'm like, okay, let's look at the ones that have the lowest occupancy. Let's tweak the prices yeah. here. We got to up the prices here. And then getting Price Labs integrated was a, was a big one getting hospitable with a lot of the the, the calendar, mm -hmm. with the messaging, that was a big one. And then I just, I was talking to my buddy, we just signed up uh, our cleaning company on Turno okay. for more cleanings there. So a lot of the systems and software I'm, I'm heavily yeah. reliant on. Yeah. And then hospitable integrates with Schlage mm -hmm. and it was like the clouds parted and I was like, this is awesome yeah. because <laughs> now the I was programming all the codes yeah. right before and then deleting and you're them. And you're a better host than we were because before <laughs> that before that integration, everyone had the same code. We, we might change it like once a month <laughs> and it's like every month we'll, we'll We'll go in and, and refresh the code, but every guy's have the same code. Oh, gotcha. It only okay. bit us in the butt once. Um, other than that, it was it was pretty good. So I want to talk a little bit about the the actual like onboarding piece, and I guess let me rephrase that. Not necessarily onboarding, but I think some of the concerns that people have when it comes to property management, short term, long term, whatever, is that you're the man in the middle yeah. because you've got to keep the tenants happy or the guests happy on the short term side, but you also have to keep the owners happy. So some people don't want to be in that position, right? It's hard enough keeping the guests happy. Now you got you know, now you have the owner to keep, keep happy as well. How did you kind of structure your uh, your co-hosting agreements to give yourself a little bit more sanity and not be so at the beck and call of the the owners? I oh, know I'm still at the beck and call yeah. of our owners. <laughs> um, I think it's just you know the, because of the co-hosting, obviously they have access to the guest questions and messaging that comes through, and some of our owners are just the guests will message and a millisecond later, the owner's texting me like, hey, you can tell them this. I'm like, okay, no, I got it. Mm -hmm. And then some are just completely hands off. Yeah. But it, it's more so setting the expectation in the beginning of like, you know, this is your property and you have final say, like I'm, I, I work for you. But at the end of the day too, like I need you to think of me as your lawyer. So like when a guest is maybe voicing some frustration or disappointment, like it's easy for an owner, I'm an owner too, to say like, well, you just don't understand, like, you know, it's not our fault, you can't read the Wi-Fi. You know, it's, it's very easy for people who are emotionally involved in a property to be, emo have an emotional response. And so, as opposed to like an owner wanting to chime in and piggyback, it's always, I, I always say like, talk to them through me. Like, let's talk first. You know, they can, the guests can wait two minutes for a response sometimes, like while we figure out what a, a nicely worded response is. But that's kind of where I'm at. Now we have, you know, my team that works remotely, and then I have, where I, what I did was I started group chats too with like our cleaners, my assistant, myself, so that if I'm not available, their message just doesn't go into the ether. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it doesn't, I mean, doesn't affect or pertain to me. It's more so like, hey, can you block out the dates? We're mm -hmm. going to go on vacation these dates and we just, you know, want the, don't want someone to book. And so right. I don't need to do that. So I have my assistant that's in that chat to know how to just take care of that. Yeah. The managing the expectations of the owner, I think, are, are a challenge. Yeah. You know, we, some we of have, them. Yeah, some of them. Some of them. Um, we have one co-hosting client right now, but we're incredibly lucky because they're a big hedge fund. <laughs> uh, so they don't really ask any questions other than like, hey, send us the P&Ls at the yeah. end of the month. Yeah, that's um, nice. But as we, as we scale up our own co-hosting business, we know that that's something that we're going to have to navigate. Yeah. And I think the way that we're, we're planning to attack that is first, we really want to focus on properties that will do at least six figures in, in gross revenue. Because, you know, if we're charging 20%, anything less than 100K is 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 it even worth our time at that right. point? But second, I think to your point about like, hey, like, let me be your lawyer. Mm -hmm. I think our approach has always been like, 
you hired us for a reason. Right. Yep. And if you knew how to do this or you wanted to do this by yourself, we're more than happy to give the keys back to you. But if you trust us, if you if you hired us for this reason, then let us do our job. I've right? had those conversations <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. But for us, like, because we, we we have some partnerships as well, where you know we have partners that are on these deals with us, mm -hmm. and even in our partnership agreements, we make it very clear about what are our responsibilities and what are their responsibilities. So, pricing, we don't consult them on pricing. You know, listing photos, listing design, like all of that stuff, we take care of. Only things we talk to our partners on are big decisions. Like, like for example, one of our listings got shut down last year. It was like an issue we had with the county, but we had to uh, either take the listing down or convert to midterm. So we had to have a discussion with the for sure, yeah. about that, right? But like big stuff. But day to day, we'll talk to you at the end of the month, you know, and just trust us during the, the middle of the probably time. Probably need to do more of that. <laughs> and we're still trying to refine that, but I think it, it gives us a little bit more sanity. And it just kind of puts the onus on them to, to trust us yeah. as well, you know? Well, I think for me, like, it's probably the same reason why I only have one VA and not five mm -hmm. is this is something that I love doing and I'm mm -hmm. passionate about. Yeah. So when I do have an owner that is really emotionally charged or really frustrated or maybe just pushing back on, like, the advice I'm giving, it's like, I'm also in this game with you. Like, I have to. I have done this. Mm -hmm. I Not that I, like, I'm the end-all be-all. I'm open to if you have a different route you want to take, but, like, same thing. You hired me for a reason. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to trust me and the judgment I have, then like what, maybe, what maybe self-managing is not f for me or <laughs> right. maybe self-managing is for you. Um, and I've had those conversations. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it does need, sometimes you do need to reset the expectation. Yeah. Um, you know, when somebody backs into your garage door, I mean, <laughs> we have, there's Airbnb, air cover, we have insurance as well, but like Shit happens. Right. Like, I mean, there's, we, they apologize. Like, we have photos. I mean, as soon as somebody checks out, we got photos. Like, we're working through it. It's just, it, it, it's it's the game of having an Airbnb. You mm -hmm. know, people are going to, like, you know, pee in your pool. And <laughs> yeah. it happens. Things happen. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted to go down that, that rabbit hole for a second, Ryan, because I think it's important for people that are listening to understand that coasting is great because the ability to scale, right? You got up to 60 units in just a few years. No money out of pocket. No money out of pocket yeah. to, to acquire those units, right? Whereas, you know, for us, the majority of our portfolio is owned, and we're talking at this point over a million dollars in equity probably into the properties. Yeah. Like that's, you know, th those are two, and not all, not a million dollars just from us. Like we have partners on that, that stuff as well, but like the ability to scale coasting is so much higher, but there's also that trade-off, I guess, yeah. of you've got a lot of voices that you're, you're kind of working with now. Yeah. You're concentrated really within, your properties are probably what, all within a couple within hours hour. of each other, yeah. an hour. Do you, do you have any hesitation around being so heavily concentrated in one area? Do you explain, do you, do you plan to expand to other cities or do you want to go deeper into this one market? I do. I was actually talking to somebody last week about if I were to start over. Personally, for me, I would start a cleaning company first, mm. which is what I did. Yeah. And I would jump it if you if you were to drop me in with you know from an airplane into a city that would be the first thing i would do i would start a cleaning company i would focus it directly on airbnb properties mm -hmm. and that allows you to learn properties mm -hmm. learn the market you know you can definitely as you're cleaning the house if you are only cleaning it once a month you know it's probably not a big rental property but you can kind of learn a little bit about the market you can build connections with the owners you know when you're having conversations with them figure out and talk through what their pain points are you're building revenue right mm -hmm. out of the gate too. Yeah. I think for somebody new, the hard part would be the first one, especially mm -hmm. if you don't have a track record of success. Like I had my, my two Airbnb, right. so I could go to our first customer and say, like, Look, this I'm, is what I've done. Mm -hmm. This is what I do. These are my, I have all these five-star reviews. To somebody that you, you do have to build that trust. And I think that in order to do that, if you don't have your own portfolio, would be through the cleaning side. Mm -hmm. Dude, that's super smart, man. I love that advice because we we did pretty much the same thing. We had a really hard time in Joshua Tree finding good cleaners. I bet. Like we cycled through a, a handful. And at the end of the day, we're like, we just need to build our own cleaning company. So we took our, our handyman's wife and daughter, never cleaned an Airbnb in their life. We said, hey, do you guys want to come work for us? And they're like, sure. And you know, now, now we're scaling that business up. But the difference between the co-hosting and the cleaning is that every host needs a cleaning company. Yep. Even if they're self-managing. And every guest is paying a cleaning fee. Every guest. So it's a pass through cost. Yeah. Right. So I, I really do. And dude, like one of my big goals for next year is to really scale up our, our cleaning company. Because right now the majority of that the cleaning company's business is like my own properties. I think we've got maybe five or six that are like external. But for that reason, 
I feel like there's a big opportunity to come in and because there, there's no big players in like the Airbnb cleaning space. You have the Vacasa, you have the Evolves, but who's the big national well-known cleaning company? There isn't. It doesn't one. exist yet. If you look at an Airbnb, the most important thing is your cleanliness. Yeah. Like if you have terrible cleanliness, like you're kind of dead in the water. Yeah, 100%. Like it, it affects so much. And so it's so important. And then when you're talking about like occupancy and let's say you have guests leaving at 11 and coming at three, like if you have a week or so that your cleaner's like, oh, by the way, I, here's some pictures I found, you know, this mirror was broken at your mm -hmm. house. Like you've already left a review for that guest and you're like, well, I, I can't, what am I supposed to do with this now? Right. So like having that integrated cleaning communication is not only just good for damages, but also like our team, if it's noon and a guest is like, hey, we're in town early, is it okay if we check in mm -hmm. early? My team can just message in our mm -hmm. same chat that we have, hey, is you know, is Papoose ready to go? Mm -hmm. That's the name of a property, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, is this one ready to go? And the cleaners just within a second are like, oh yeah, it's clean, ready to yeah, go. Ready. Yeah. You know, and we can we can either charge an early check-in fee or you know, whatever we gotta do. But it's so important to just be nimble on the cleanliness side of it when you're managing as well. Yeah, dude, super excited for for the cleanly or for the cleaning company growth. Um, so I guess we touched on a little bit, but like what, what cities do you have in mind in terms of where you want to go next for the co-hosting business or, or for the cleaning company? I like Arizona. I like Arizona because, you know, I see a lot of markets out there that are blowing up really quickly. Um, and the cities and lo localities are really starting to catch on. And, you know, I think, I think Big Bear is probably like the first one that comes to mind for me where their regulation went so far because it, 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 it just picked up so quickly that now I think they're starting to like scale it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I like Arizona because it's it's steady. It's one of those drivable vacation destinations for people that are in California from Nevada, um, you know, and we know the locality of it too. Um, I like Arizona. I would like to dabble in California. I don't want to step on your territory. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because I live here. Right. But I think right now Arizona is a good one. I just, I'm so focused on making sure that like, we continue to provide value for our properties and our guests. So like my big goal in 2024 is direct booking. Mm. So like I, w I was telling my buddy, I woke up this morning with two new direct bookings and one new Airbnb booking. That's super cool. And I want at one point to have Airbnb and my direct bookings nights mm. be the same. Yeah. Because I think also scalability wise, like I'm never going to do it. But if I were to approach somebody who wanted to buy my company, I can say I have this platform that does a million dollars, two million a year yeah. in booking revenue. You don't think and you'd ever sell your, your co-hosting business? That's actually I, my goal. Like I want to, I want to build it. What would you do it. after? Whatever I, I just want. Just be bored. Yeah, but you find you build something else. You know, I feel like if you're an entrepreneur uh, at heart, you kind of find those things. That's true. But that's really my goal. Like I, I want to give myself probably a decade is what I said of really building up our commercial business. So okay. like buying the boutique hotels and motels. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we're closing our first one before this month is over, and then building up the cleaning company and the property management yeah. company, and then turn those into sellable assets. Yeah. Because if I give myself a decade to build those businesses, the goal is that we've got a pretty healthy exit at yeah. the end of the decade. And you know, you're just a better investor than me, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I look at like I, I look up to a combination of Cody Sanchez yeah. and Avery Carl. I yeah. like Avery how she's got the huge portfolio of properties with. Hers is a little bit small, smaller percentage of her in the short term world. Right. But I love that her and like Grant Cardone, they have like this massive real estate portfolio. But I also really like Cody Sanchez, how she is really into buying these what she calls boring, boring businesses. businesses. One of the things I'm still looking for is to buy a laundromat in in Lake Havasu yeah. because essentially I'm kind of trying to guess buy down the supply chain for it. But mm -hmm. it's one of those boring businesses that, you know, it just adds it works. to it. I yeah. think that's one of the big lessons I learned from COVID is multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's so many people that lost livelihoods that, you know, just did a lot of damage to their psyche because the world changed obviously understandably at that time. But also like when you have just one income, like you do feel trapped. 100%. And having at one point when I was working for Microsoft and we were, we were growing and building and have, making good revenue from the co-hosting side, not that I got cocky at work, but it's just a different feeling when you, when you're showing up and when you're working because like knowing that you don't have to, mm -hmm. but like 
not kind of like all Kanye, like you should be honored by my lateness, <laughs> yeah. but like you get what I'm saying. Like there's a different kind of vibe when you don't have to rely on this particular job that you're here, not just to feed your family. It, it's, it's happening regardless. Dude, couldn't have said it better myself. It, it, and someone once told me, a successful friend of mine uh, said that one is the most dangerous number in business. Like you never have, you never yeah. want to have one of anything yeah. because if there's only one and that one goes away, now what are you going to do? Yeah. Right. So he's like, you want at least two of everything. If you can get three or four, that's even better. Yeah. And I think it's true for us as well. Now, one thing I will say is that I do think there's a common misconception that people have because you hear all the time, like, hey, the average mil millionaire has like eight different streams of income. Yeah. But oftentimes they started with one, got really good at that yeah. one, and then they scaled out from there. Like at a, at a high level, you look at someone like Elon Musk, who's the CEO of like four or five different companies. Mm -hmm. Right. But he started with one company yeah. and then sold that to whoever for like a big exit. Yeah. And then he started all these other little things because he had a, he had a whole bunch of money to do yeah. that. Um, even for you, right? Like you started off, I'm really going to focus on co-hosting. Then when you got good at that, okay, cool. Let me add the uh, cleaning company. Okay, cool. Now let me add maybe the laundromat. And, and even yep. so, they're all so related. Yeah. But I, ju I just want to caution the folks that are watching from saying, I'm going to start eight things today yeah, no, no, <laughs> and no, try no, and be no, good no. at all eight of those things yeah, today. No, no. Well, and just, I mean, yeah, I, I, you, you kind of, I mean, it's, it's one of those things about getting into business is like you just throw yourself out there and you figure it out. Like, and I think a lot of people are scared to throw themselves out there because the figuring out is the, the scary part. But like, you know, when I was working for Microsoft and having my one little Airbnb, did it, did I think that I would be managing and owning a cleaning company mm -hmm. in like Havasu mm -hmm. at this point? No, like you just, I mean, your, your ride takes you wherever it goes, but for, you know, for the, for the business minded people, they're always looking for those those niches to kind of dig deep in and to, and to be involved in. Last question I want to ask you, Ryan, uh, there's been a lot of talk this year about the Airbnb bust. And I'll, I'll say that, you know, obviously 2021 was a phenomenal year, yeah. like across the board for all of my properties. Um, 2022 was a, a little bit more normalized, but still better than, than post COVID. And it is somewhat market dependent. We've seen a bigger pullback, like summer this year in Josh Street was really slow, slower than it's ever been. Tennessee on the other hand, chugging along just like how it was last year, right? Uh, we just set up some units in, in Texas, super solid market, right? So it is somewhat market-based, but what's your perspective on the Airbnb bus? Do you think that there's still opportunity for new investors who want to get started in this space? Yes, I'm bullish in 2024. I think that 2023 was a year where everybody took a step back to regather. So like in my markets specifically, I, I mean, you, you sort of saw supply go down in some ways because I think the people that got into it late in the game were not aware or comfortable with the seasonality of certain mm -hmm. things. Um, ADR, so average nightly rates went down probably everywhere mm -hmm. slightly. And so for some people, those numbers on the short-term side didn't make sense. And so they moved to either midterm or long-term renters just because they couldn't stomach it. But because interest rates were so high, new supply of these people popping up with these new Airbnbs has gone down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's obviously talks of interest rates coming down in 2024, but Re recession, depression, people are still going to travel. Um, and so if supply has gone down, demand will still continue to grow. And I think that's why I'm bullish and, and going hard on our direct booking because, I mean, for a $1,000 a night property, say the fees, I mean, are insane that someone would be saving. So they're still looking to save and it comes down to value and what kind of value you're adding to it. And I mean, I think Airbnb is not going anywhere. Um, I think they're also kind of, figuring out where mm -hmm. they're at as well. Um, but no, I don't think there's an Airbnb bus. Yeah. I think the only Airbnb bus would be if cities or markets overregulate. Yeah. yeah. That's where I could see a lot of like it just getting, but that's, that's just, it's, it's market specific. And we, we just dropped a video on Airbnb regulations. I'll, I'll put that in the description here, but I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's still a lot of upside here. And I do think we're starting to see things balance out with the, the post COVID boom, like 50% of all the listings on Airbnb today came post COVID. And there's a lot of people who thought they wanted to do this or realized that they don't. Yep. And I think we're going to see a lot of those people that, that jump out because they were dabbling, right? They, they weren't trying to be professional hosts that do this full-time. a lot more money to throw around, too. Yeah, yeah, for sure, right? So I think 2024 is going to be a year of balancing out where you will see supply, at least the rate of increase in, of supply in a lot of markets slow down. But demand is continuing to increase, and I think that's a good thing for all of us. I agree. Last question for you, man. If someone wanted to get started today in this space what would your advice be to them? And like co-hosting? Co 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 in Airbnb, co-hosting in general. I would say figuring out what your interests are. So like, for example, I think I was, I was on, it was on one of your calls mm -hmm. 
where if somebody's got like a design background, um, you know, they don't have a real estate portfolio, they don't have any sort of, you know, track record necessarily, but they love design, they love, you know, uh, interior design and things like that, like find, go on study Airbnb and find those like boring ass houses that are on there that have wide open calendars, pitch the owner your portfolio and say like, hey, I'll do two or three accent walls for you for free if you let me manage your house. And I I know that when we you know update this and do this, like I could bring you more bookings and stuff like that. It's figuring out like what you're good at, what your interests are. And then if you want to tweak it to Airbnb doing that, like I said, I would start with a cleaning company. Yeah, yeah just but also just figure out how, where you fit. Like yeah. It's if you if you are have a hospitality background and maybe you you approach somebody who's got a really popular listing but they have bad reviews, and say like hey like I have a background in hospitality this is my resume or blah 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 but like I can help you get your re reviews back up to four point nine or higher you know and I'll take over all the guest communication for you at a discount or something like that like just figuring out where you fit. Mm -hmm. And I think you know what you displayed so well is just like like what's the word that I'm looking for just like. Being tenacious, right? Like being scrappy, I think is where I was looking yeah. for it, right? Yeah. Like not waiting for something to fall into your lap, but just going out there and hustling and making those things happen. And if, and if something does, like just go. Mm -hmm. Don't don't hesitate. Don't think twice about it. Just go. Right. You you figure do, it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what a lot of people miss, right? They get stuck in the analysis paralysis, yeah. man. Dude, you, you delivered a ton of value today. Really appreciate you coming on and sharing Thanks. your story. But where can people go to find out more about you? So our company's Desert Concierge Management. We're really active on there. Um, a lot of our reels. We we not just share information about our properties, but more so the Airbnb market. Our you know, especially as it retain, uh, pertains to us, um, Desert Concierge Management on Instagram. We do have our own uh, direct booking platform on there. The link is in the bio. So if you want to book out one of our properties there, that would be the best way. Okay, cool, man. What about you? Are you on social yourself? I am, but it's just about all my kids. Yeah. Like, I don't really, I mean, if you're on my social, if you follow me, I mean, it's either we're at Disneyland yeah. or I'm losing my mind as a dad. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm on there too. Okay, cool, brother. Well, appreciate you coming on, man, and looking forward to the next time that we get you on the, the channel here. Sounds good, yeah. Cool, man. Cool.